Amanda Knox, born. Sono Amanda Knox, sono nata. <laughs> July 9th, 1987. Um, uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, Seattle. Hello, and welcome to The Wrongfully Convicted. On tonight's installment, Megan Billings discusses the story of Amanda Knott and how, or why, she was wrongfully convicted. Today I'm here outside the Cabernet Prison in Perugia, Italy, where Amanda Knox served four years of a 26-year sentence as an innocent woman. On this investigative episode of Wrongfully Convicted, we're going to be looking at the high-profile case of the Merrick Kircher murder and how Amanda Knox was wrongfully convicted for it for 20 years. In November of 2007, Meredith Kircher was found brutally, sexually assaulted, and murdered inside her home. Meredith was a British exchange student who lived with Amanda in a cute cottage home close to their school campus in Perugia. What occurred that night is still somewhat of a mystery, but here's what we do know. Amanda and Meredith were only friends for two short months before Meredith was murdered. Amanda and Raphael were only dating for five short days before they were forced to stand trial together. On the night of November 2nd, 2007, Amanda and Raphael both claimed they were at Raphael's apartment for the night. The next morning, Amanda decided to go home to shower and clean up. When she got to her home, she noticed that the door had been left open, which wasn't unusual because the hinge was broken. Amanda continued on to the bathroom to have her shower. She noticed two small drops of blood in the sink, which again, she didn't think was unusual. It wasn't until Amanda got out of the shower that she realized that there was a bloody footprint on the bath mat. This is when she realized that something was very wrong. <laughs> It wasn't long before the police arrived. The first thing they did was knock down Meredith's bedroom door, where they found her dead body on the floor, covered in a blanket. As you can see, the crime was a brutal one. And if that wasn't traumatizing enough, let's take a look Either I'm a psychopath in sheep's clothing, or I am you. Amanda Knox was an average American girl from Seattle, Washington. She worked three jobs in order to pay for her year of non-year. What she thought would be the best year of her life turned out to be the start of the worst decade of her life. In many wrongful conviction cases, the defendant is commonly a marginalized individual. Amanda didn't have obvious differentiating factors, which is why the media and individuals made her out to be different. Amanda was young and innocent, but portrayed to be a drug addict, a sex fiend, a foreigner, and an unstable psychopath. Amanda's family was forced to declare bankruptcy to pay for their legal fees. But for them, it was worth it to prove that their daughter was not this person. Belle La Figura, literally defined as a beautiful figure. Italians apply this phrase to people who have a large concern with keeping up appearances. This phrase has been applied many times to the Perugia Police Department. They were driven to show everybody that they were capable of dealing with crimes large and horrific in size so they could be seen as legitimate and effective. Police misconduct begins at the very beginning of Meredith's murder. During the examination of the crime scene, the police failed to adequately change their suits, their gloves, and their boots, which ended up contaminating the entire crime scene. In addition to the incompetent crime scene handling, during the investigation, the police illegally wiretapped Amanda and Raphael's cell phones. The largest aspect of police misconduct in the Amanda Knox case was the false confession. I was demolished in that interrogation. I, I can only describe it as breaking down. I didn't know what I remembered and what I didn't remember anymore. Police told me that 
I had amnesia and that I better remember the truth. The police interrogated Amanda without a lawyer present. They used their coercive techniques to get Amanda to incriminate herself with a false, coerced, internalized confession. I trusted them. I was, I was hit on the back of the head. I was yelled at. I, police were coming in and out of the room telling me that I was a liar. Like why in the world would anyone confess to something they didn't do? Well, a lot of cases of someone who is wrongfully convicted include a false confession where someone was put through coercive interrogation techniques. Another horrific example of police misconduct occurred when Amanda was in prison. The police told Amanda that one of the doctors in the prison had got the results back from her HIV test and that her results were positive. The police lied to Amanda about a serious medical condition in order to get her to write down her secrets in her prison diary. They later stole this diary from her cell and released it to the public. There's no evidence that links her to this crime other than she said some stupid things after, uh, you know, being tormented for hours. And Forensic and DNA evidence is a crucial part to any crime investigation. As a suspect, it can either save you or ruin you. In the case of Amanda Knox, the police and the prosecution framed this evidence to ruin her. There are many instances where the police forensic lab either downplayed or disregarded crucial forensic evidence. Forensic experts emphasize the fact that Amanda and Raphael's DNA was found inside Meredith's room. Although this was true and not unusual because Amanda lived there and Raphael spent a large amount of time there, they downplayed the fact that Rudy Gaudet, the third man involved, had a large portion of DNA inside the room. Another forensic error involved the knife found in Raphael's apartment. The prosecution used this knife for a substantial part of their case. They claimed that Amanda's DNA was on the handle of the knife and that Mary the Kircher's DNA was on the blade. When forensic experts were finally allowed to examine the DNA of evidence, they came to the conclusion that yes, Amanda's DNA was for sure on the handle of the knife, but Mary's DNA was in such a small amount that it was likely and definitely contamination. The independent forensic expert asked the police lab if they had examined all of Meredith's items separately. The police admitted to analyzing at least 50 of Kircher's samples at the same time, including the knife, which confirmed the conclusion that the knife's DNA of Meredith was contamination. It was discovered that a police computer expert accidentally destroyed evidence on Amanda and Raphael's computers that would corroborate their alibi. You're trying to find the answer in my eyes when the answer is right over there. You're looking at me. Why? These are my eyes. They're not objective evidence. Giuliano McNamee was head prosecutor of the Amanda Knox case. The only words that could be used to describe him are bias, determined, and corrupt. His tunnel vision led him to nonstop pursue Amanda, even when the real killer had been arrested and convicted. Well, there was a prosecutor who had tunnel vision, who had this idea that I was guilty and I was guilty no matter what. He the prosecutor continued to pursue Amanda even after DNA evidence proved that it was Rudy. He had already publicly admitted to their guilt and he did not want to damage his reputation. I'm a victim of his persistence in error. I want to say, for me it's culpable, Amanda, because he said too many bullshit. After the first guilty conviction, Meredith's family made a statement saying that they were pleased with the decision, but it wasn't a time to celebrate. Meredith was still brutally murdered and that needed to be acknowledged. Giuliano McNini disagreed. He believed that it was a time for celebration. He was glorified by people walking down the street wanting to shake his hand. He said that he felt like a celebrity. I know exactly what this guy is all about. He's a maniac. And I watched this maniac who's being prosecuted for abuse. Immediately after the Knox case, Giuliano McNini was congratulated for his double conviction and promoted to head prosecutor. As of 2015, Giuliano McNini has been convicted of abuse of power and the case is currently pending appeal. Our society makes judges absolute decision makers and frames them to be superior and untouchable. Having this much power and influence is a horrific thing if not used properly. 
In the trials of Amanda Knox, there are many instances of judicial bias and wrongful use of power, making this wrongful conviction accountability present in every level of the criminal justice system. Judges are very influential, so when they have personal views, it is dangerous in the criminal justice system. In the first trial, the judge would not grant the defense an independent DNA review because he believed that there was already enough evidence to convict Amanda. The judge also would not grant Amanda house arrest because she showed no remorse when there hadn't even been a trial yet. She was presumed guilty from the start. Goffman's mortification of self is very present here. It is evident that when people declare their innocence instead of showing remorse, they are treated less fairly in the criminal justice system. This is extremely problematic for wrongfully convicted individuals who refuse to play along. In Italy, judges have to make a motivational report explaining their verdict. After Amanda's first guilty conviction, the judge's report stated that the evidence was possible and therefore probable. Keep in mind that the standard of proof is still beyond a reasonable doubt in Italy. Murder by media. Trial by media. These are just some of the terms used to describe how much of an impact the media had in the trial and conviction of Amanda Knox. Perugia's smaller population of 160,000 people and the fact that this crime was an international incident, combining Meredith from Britain, Amanda from America, and Raphael from Italy, amplified the media's role and framed everybody's perception on who Amanda was. To see your name on the front page, with a great story that everyone's talking about. It's just a fantastic buzz. I mean, I'd like to say it's like having sex or something like that, you know? The media attacked every aspect of Amanda's life, making normal things seem extreme and putting her in a negative light. The media took Amanda's childhood soccer name, Foxy Noxy, and turned it into a sexual nickname. One example of this is when Amanda and Raphael were seen kissing right after they found out Meredith was murdered. The media portrayed this to seem like they lacked remorse. Another example is when Amanda went to a common garment store to buy underwear because all of her belongings were in the crime scene and non-accessible. The media told the story as if her and Raph went to a sexy lingerie store to buy thongs for the hot sex that they were going to have, again, making her seem like she lacked remorse and was obsessed with sex. Another example was Amanda doing yoga stretches the first time that she went into the police station for questioning. She had been sitting for over 20 hours and was very stressed out. The media told the story that she was a lunatic doing cartwheels in the police station. Couldn't ask for any better material to illustrate a story with. The media twisted all of these aspects in order to increase the social distance between Amanda and everyone else in order to make Amanda a monster if she was the real killer. They want the reassurance that they know who the bad people are and it's not them. The reason for all of this negative media attention on Amanda was to penalize her further. Not only did she violate traditional gender roles, but she also broke the law. She was doubly deviant, and the world wanted to make sure she knew it. Italy's trial system is very different from that of America and Canada. In Italy, you have an initial trial, then an automatic appeal to review the case. After this, you may appeal that decision to the Italian Court of Cassation, which would be their Supreme Court and their last resort. Amanda's case consisted of two convictions and two acquittals, all very controversial. It is important to note that during Amanda's trial, the jury was not sequestered. This means that they were not isolated from all of the media and bias within the city of Perugia. This is standard practice in Italy, but in a case like this, it is very problematic. The first trial took place in the court of first instance. Amanda was convicted for the murder of Meredith and sentenced to 26 years in prison. I couldn't believe it because I still believed that it was impossible to convict an innocent person. This is, this is a miscarriage of justice. I think people should boycott Italy. They shouldn't go to Italy. This is not a close call. This isn't somebody that may, may be guilty. She's not guilty. Italian law allows for automatic appeal, which means a complete second trial. In this trial, the request for independent DNA review was granted. Two experts concluded that the knife with Meredith and Amanda's DNA on it are unreliable and contaminated. 
The judge criticized the trial court for not using beyond a reasonable doubt, and Amanda was found not guilty. Giuliano Magnini has appealed this decision. During the third trial, at the highest court of instance, which is the Court of Cassation, they decided purely on circumstantial and behavioral evidence that Amanda would have to stand trial again for the murder of Meredith Kircher. The judges sent back the decision to the appeal courts to decide in trial. The appeal courts reinstated the guilty verdict of Amanda Knox. I tried to force myself to sleep because I, it was difficult to be awake. Amanda immediately appealed to the Italian Supreme Court so they could make the final and last decision. Amanda was fully exonerated by the Italian Supreme Court in March of 2015. The Supreme Court's reasoning for Amanda's final acquittal included investigative flaws and increased media attention, which created a frantic search for guilty parties, the lack of biological evidence for Amanda, and that the evidence still points solely to Rudy's guilt. Thank you to everyone who's believed in me, who's defended me, who's supported my family. After reviewing the case of Amanda Knox and the factors that led to her wrongful conviction, it is clear that this was a large miscarriage of justice. After being exonerated in 2015, Amanda has decided to use her experience to make a difference and help others. Let's take a look at where she is now acknowledging that and acknowledging that I'm not the only one like there are plenty of exonerees who are going through worse than I have and what's important is you know I'm gonna take ownership of the fact that I'm an exoneree and I'm gonna share the fact that there is a voice to be heard with them wrongful convictions happen everywhere it's not like we're safe from wrongful convictions because we're here in the United States there are systematic problems that exist that so maybe that's what it is. We're all afraid. And fear makes people crazy. So that was the story of Amanda Knox and why justice should not be a game. Tune in next week where we talk about David Milgar and investigate his story further. Thank you for watching.